what we want is a system that can produce enough and nutritious food for everyone, but at the same time be respectful to the environment. That's the sustainability we need. This is Climate Curious, the podcast for people who are bored, scared or confused by climate change. I'm Marion Pasha, the director and curator at Telex London and the co-host of this podcast, alongside the amazing Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Hurst, activist and advocate exploring what positive masculinities can look like and self-confessed climate normie. Okay, so when we're, when we're talking about food, mm-hmm. what, what specifically are we talking about? Because I feel like that's a big... Yep. category right like and, and in my mind my mind immediately goes to like dairy or like you're not supposed to eat cheese or drink milk or are we talking about farming or like I don't know what what it is specifically that's the problem with when you say like the problem is the way that we live our lives or mm-hmm. our lifestyles yeah how does what's the problem with the way that we consume food or is it not about our consumption is it about something else it's the whole system is about the production and the consumption. And take just these two for simplicity. The production is mainly the the business model that's been used since the Second World War, which was to produce food, to have enough food for everyone. But that came now at an expense because we continue to produce food, uh, which caused the depletion of soil quality, the decline of biodiversity. Food model, and unfortunately, is not nourishing people uh-huh. because we still have um, you know, billions, around three billions of people who can't actually afford just a basic healthy diet. And then we have around 828 million people who go hungry every day. Right. So the problem of food is, is the fact that um, the way we produce and consume food is not sustainable. And I'll just give you one, one example that really explains this very well. So we produce food for, for human consumption. A third of that is thrown away. So that's the problem. But w- so, why? <laughs> why? Why? Why are we doing that? Because Ex- you, the model the model came into existence after the Second World War when we were like, let's make enough food so that everybody's got food. That's right. So why are we producing so much food when people don't? Is there why a simple? Is, there's a simple away? answer to that, right? Is, 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 is the other a, way around? Is 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 the fact that we don't actually value food? Food okay. actually is cheap, so people throw it away. Uh, and, and the important thing now is that the food, the third of the food that is um, wasted uh, contributes around 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, that's a lot. So it's not negligible. And when you that's throw bad. food away, <laughs> yeah. you throw away the energy, the water, right. the, the soil, everything that went into producing the, the, the efforts of the farmers. Right. So basically, we, we, we lost our connection with food. Mm. And that's the thing, you know, we, we don't see the food as, as something that we should value and care about, mm. enjoy it, and not to throw it. I mean, you don't throw your mobile phone away. No, uh, I you wouldn't. value yeah, it. No. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the it same costs with a food. Lot of money. <laughs> the same with food. So I think, you know, what needs to happen is, you know, all of us, you know, when you go shopping, when you plan, you know, your meals, etc., you have to think about the fact that it's not something that we should be throwing away. Mm. At least given that, as I said, 828 million people go hungry every day. When we dig into the numbers that you've mentioned, mm-hmm. the, the, the people who both either don't have access to healthy, fresh, nutritious food or yeah. people who go mm-hmm. without, where are most of these people located? I'm going to guess that they are in the poorer parts of the world or in the poorer communities around the world. The, the figure is around the world. So obviously there are some parts of the world that like in, in Africa and, and Latin America and others who actually have, have um, you know, a high percentage of, of hunger as well. Mm-hmm. But it's across the board. Even in developed countries, mm-hmm. actually yesterday when I was in, in Washington, I could see food banks there. Mm. So it's, it's across the board, which, right. is, which is really, um, you know, shocking. So the way forward, what we want is a system that can produce enough and nutritious food for everyone, but at the same time be respectful to the environment. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the sustainability we need. Because if you want to defeat hunger, then we have to start acting on these aspects. Produce enough food that can nourish people, mm. but at the same time you know, preserves biodiversity, ecosystem, 
um, services because without that basis we cannot produce food and produce food for everyone and, and just finish with that, that why is it also very key because we have all these competing crises and at the same time we have a growing population mm. so basically we need to almost double the production of food if you want to feed everyone at the same rate by 2050 but is, so this is like awakening the conspiracy theorists in me I always I have these episodes where I'm like mm, the world is <laughs> <laughs> we need to fix everything but I because mm-hmm. I feel like when you say we need to double the amount of production of food surely the, the issue is not the if we're producing more food than we like we waste two thirds of the food that we produce is the issue then one, the redistribution of, of one third of the, of the food so, that yeah. we yeah we, <laughs> we waste one third we waste one third of the food that we produce is the issue not then an issue of redistribution rather than of production that, that's just one part of it right okay um, you know we, we need to to produce more food if we want to feed everyone mm-hmm. um, but, but we need to do that more efficiently efficiently okay. on the production side and efficiently on the consumption side. Okay. So if you get rid of that waste, it's going to make a big difference to start with. Yeah? Mm. And then the production also has to be adjusted to the parameters I said that produce food that is actually nutritious for people right. and at the same time that doesn't, doesn't destroy the environment basically okay. and doesn't contribute to climate change. Right. So let's, let's dig into that. So I want us to deconstruct the production a little bit mm-hmm. and look at <laughs> the different ways it's impacting the environment. Will you take us some, through some of the kind of the big, the big culprits, the big areas when you look at a food system, the big points, villains. Point some fingers. Whose yeah. fault is it? We no, want to know people, who's to but, blame. But in terms of like the things that we are doing or the ways that right. our system operates that are causing the, are creating the biggest part of the problem. Well, I think that the main thing I mentioned, you know, I'm not pointing fingers to no, anyone in no. particular. <laughs> I mean, just to clarify. Uh, yeah, I think the, the main thing is we need to take responsibility all together mm-hmm. of how we connect with food. That's the main thing, okay? So the waste I mentioned is a big issue. And, and it's sort of relatively easy actually to address if people are uh, informed about that and change their mindset, mm. their attitude. This is so critical because everything we do at the end of the day has to go down to people. And if people don't respond, then we're not going to get the change we want. Mm. You know, we, we need to transform these agri-food systems for the reasons I mentioned. Mm. You know, we need to, to change the model so we have sustainability at the heart of, of food production. And it's so important because, you know, we, we all need food. Yeah? But we have to do it in, in a sustainable way. So what does that mean? Yeah. Is that one, one important factor, because I mentioned, um, you know, people. Uh, we're all responsible for, for that. Our choices matter a lot. What we choose to eat, right. when, it matters a lot. So we have to be very careful in, in, in that. So we don't contribute to, you know, more. But that's to on the consumption side, right? Yes. Yeah. But on the production, as that because the consumption side makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, if you come, if you have the uh, like privilege to choose, and like in terms of what you eat, where yeah. it's sourced, make sure you're not wasting it. You have refrigeration, all of that kind of stuff. But in terms of production, I I want to understand like if we did if we cut that one third. Would that cut the whole problem with the food system? No. I said that's an important oh, right. part of the problem. But there's not the whole problem, yeah, right? The, no. The okay. production side, if you zoom in into the production side, there there is a big scope for efficiency. Okay. For potential to make savings uh, in how we produce food. Because, you know, production of food, for instance, relies a lot on the use of water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and the use of electricity on farms. Yeah. So there, there is a lot of potential again in savings, in looking at the efficiency side of production. Mm. So there is the sustainability and efficiency. And this is also important in the current climate where uh, the cost of fertilizers has gone you know, sky high. Has it? It has, because of the war in Ukraine. Right. You know, the Why fertilizer? I mean, I think yeah, for, like, like for people that. who, you'd be like, like what does fertilizer have to do with the war in Ukraine? This is a good question. (laughs) Okay. Well, Ukraine and Russia, they're big producers. Well, Russia is big producers of fertilizers. Okay. Mm. Okay. And and Russia is a big producer of wheat in particular that many countries rely on that. Right. And and, um, 
uh, other crops as well. So that part affected you know, the, the rest of the world in terms of distribution of food. Okay? So coming back to what I was saying, um, in terms of you want to produce food, you need certain inputs. Yeah. And one of them is fertilizers. Okay. But here I want to highlight the, the element of efficiency. Okay. This is the time now to rethink uh, about farming and precision mm. farming for, for efficiency. If we want to have really better production that is aligned with the environmental production, then we need to think about the efficiency. And there is a huge scope for that, for efficiency on, on farm. As I said, for the nutrients, um, but also for the use of electricity on farm. And it has opportunities as well, because that means there are many farms now that look at renewable energy mm. as you know, a source of electricity on farm. Mm. And you combine that with the use of water, and you have efficiency in the use of electricity, and like drip irrigation, for instance, in, in, in the use of water. So the production, yeah. my point okay. on that is that the production also needs to align to the new reality of climate change, but also the geopolitical situation. And how's that going? Because I, I, I feel, cause, right, because I feel like we've spoken to people who are on the cutting edge of innovation in terms of like new ways of farming and uh -huh. using new sustainable methods and like... Uh, and reimagining. Right, reimagining what that looks like. But is that is that something, because obviously we're not farmers, so, so I have, I have yeah. no connection to like farming communities around the world. Is this something that is like taking place and like we're in a, a good position or is this something that's not happening enough at the moment or not happening quickly enough? Well, basically, the, um, the, if, you, if you're talking about that in, in the overall context of climate change, mm. um, all the efforts around the world, they're not enough right. in taking us into the transformation we want. We need to be much faster than that. Um, but now the, 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 the succession of this crisis, it raises awareness mm. about the fact that we need to adjust, we need to do things faster. Right. And this is why, like in, in FAO, what we do... Um, what, what's the FAO for people who don't know? The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Right. So we have a mandate to defeat hunger and our work... So what we've talked about so far is about mitigation, right? Mitigating uh -huh. climate... Mm -hmm. in the impacts of, 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 of carbon intensive agriculture on the climate. Yeah. These are for people who are like, have been listening for four seasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've learned some, they've they've learned learned some, some lingo. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the impact, the other side, like one of the other sides, the impacts of climate and climate change on our food systems and the way they need to adapt. So that adaptation side. I'm wondering if you can talk us through a little bit about what we're, what we're already seeing as some of the consequences of climate change on, on our food systems. Yeah, so that's an important one because you're right, we've been focusing a lot on reducing emissions from the sector, mm. but adaptation becomes much more important because we, we left it so late basically to, to address the impact of climate change. So what we've been seeing, if you just take the example of this year, so you, you've heard about all the drought we had in Europe, for mm -hmm. instance, like in, in the United Kingdom, that was, you know, drought was declared Unbearable. officially. Yeah. You know, a yeah. country where it rains most of the time. And, and then it's, it's, it's reality in the US as well. Yeah. yeah. We had drought here. So as, as I said earlier, agriculture rely heavily on the use of water. Right. Yeah. So when you have drought, you can see the impact that will have on food production. Um, the same when you look at the other extreme, uh, floods mm. and hurricanes. We'll take the example of floods. The same again, it destroys you know, all the harvests and, and fields. And, and this is the impact of climate change that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that this frequency is going to increase. The intensity is going to increase. We'll see more and more of this unless we act so quickly. Mm. But the problem we have is that these impacts I'm talking about, about climate change, they're much faster. Yeah. than the actions we're taking. Yeah. Right. Yeah? yeah. So we need to take climate change really seriously. And it seems to me, I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but it seems to me the idea, like you look at Pakistan, mm, I, I'm half exactly. Pakistani, a third of a country being underwater, you know, mm -hmm. is the immediate humanitarian crisis, but I'm assuming from your perspective and, and at the FAO, you're looking at the long-term impacts of that flooding on agriculture, on food production, loss of harvest, all of that kind of things. And, we're thinking that this is just the beginning of the extreme weather events. It seems 
mind-boggling. <clears throat> it is. I think it's around 30 million people displaced in Pakistan yeah. because of that. And when you see those images, then I think that's the kind of thing we want to see, for people to see, to connect with the reality mm. and start acting on, on, on climate change. So it's not just at, at the political level, yeah. it's at the individual level as well. Yeah. It's not just about stuff in the air, it's about yeah. really people's lives. Yeah. And, and then, you know, from what you were saying, there is one important dimension going forward, which is to build resilience. Mm. Okay? So if we take you know, this conclusion from scientists from all around the world that this is coming, is going to continue, is going to intensify, so you could say, well, this flooding we're seeing in, in, in Pakistan is not going to be the last one. Yeah. Right. So when it happens again, are we going to be better prepared for prepare? that? Yeah. You know, mm. How do we cope better and this applies to all countries why because the intergovernmental on climate change the ipcc says concluded that climate change now affects every part of the world yeah because i couldn't get potatoes the other day i think that was this, what, this is that a was, travesty but <laughs> no oh no sorry i know we're talking about really serious things <laughs> but i do i do think there was a moment for me the other day where i was like oh this is like an actual tangible reality in terms of like my access to food that's but you're, being produced. You're, you're right because this is this is the disruption right that we're going to start facing yeah because when you have you have floodings in an area where it's important for uh, exporting food or a local area that's important for producing mm. food, then you'll have no harvest this particular year. Mm. Right. Yeah? And if the situation doesn't get better for the next harvest, so you can imagine yeah. you know, the, the consequences. Mm. What you said is an example of what would happen at an individual level in mm. terms of reality. You know, mm. Now you, you, we have the luxury where you go and find food available and choice of food. Yeah. We've seen you know, how these crises disrupt that supply and yeah. the COVID was classic. I mean, it started by with people fighting over toilet paper. I think in some parts <laughs> of the world. That was wild times, be, man. My gosh! But but that <laughs> shows um, and people um, obviously you know for food they, they would migrate. You yeah. know you can't stop hungry people. Yeah, you know if you're hungry, you find you're food. Move. Yeah. yeah, and and this is the kind of future that we need to to prepare for, and that's why for us global food security obviously it's important. And having strategies that can allow you to see where you need to act and with whom mm. is important. So we have two new strategies on climate change. Okay, yeah. Tell us and about tell us about what you're gonna do. <laughs> yeah, well, this is like a vicious cycle, right? Yeah, like, yeah my gosh. Well, so what what we do um, is at three main levels. Yeah. The one which is the global advocacy, you know, to to inform international policy and international direction by what we do at FAO in terms of generating the evidence, the tools we have, the information, the support we can give. And then the second dimension is at the country and regional level where we work with countries directly having projects on the ground where again we implement and we provide technical and policy support on these issues. And this is all towards the transformation we want to see, yeah? the, the, the future I mentioned earlier, the sustainability. And the third dimension, which is also important, is to act at the local and farm level. Because mm. that's, if you want transformation, obviously it has to start also from the local mm. level for farmers to be prepared for the, the extreme weather events I was describing earlier. Um, you know, the, the supports that, that farmers and communities need. And there are various tools there in, in terms of in some communities, having just uh, a mobile phone makes a difference. If you're a farmer, you just want to have information about some crops from other, another farmer, you want to know the cost of certain uh, commodities in the market, etc. That can make, make a big difference. But there are also other aspects in terms of being able to store food for at least one or two extra days so you can take it to, to the market. These things make, make a difference. Um, so... You know, for us in, in FAO, I'm just giving you an example mm. of the three dimensions where, where we act. And this is what we're reflecting in our, in our new strategy, okay. strategy on climate change. And the second strategy is on science and innovation. Okay. Because science and innovation is critical to this transformation and to building the resilience I was talking about. Mm -hmm particularly in many developing countries where science and innovation is so key in developing the capacity to, to deal with food security mm. in terms of, of research, in terms of adapting to the extreme weather events I mentioned. You yeah. know, 
crops that are tolerant to drought, to salinity, um, you know, things like that. I, f- so I feel like I'm starting, in my mind, I'm starting to see how it fits together, right? So there's uh-huh. a, an issue of uh, the way that we produce food globally um, and the demand for that supply is being driven by us who are consuming food in, in the wrong ways and wasting food, which mm-hmm. then causes the problem, which makes it harder for people to make the food so then people die or people have to move to find more food or whatever. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to ask the question so we can change it, but it, for for the average listener to the podcast, uh-huh. right, the, the average city dweller mm. um, who is <clears throat> making daily decisions about what they buy from the supermarket, what is something that that person can do? What is something that that person can do? Or like, what's a decision that I can make when I leave here today that will change these circumstances in some way? Okay, I'll give you an example. Um, the, um, let, let's start from the, the global situation where we are, which is basically what we're trying to do is avoid dangerous climate change, mm-hmm. dangerous, dangerous to, to our lives. So the conclusion from the scientists from around the world is every fraction of the warming matters makes right. a big difference yeah so that needs to be reflected to what we need to do so that every little action we take will also make a difference so we should not underestimate that mm. so we need to take responsibility and i think there's a lot of common sense here and i'll give you an example when we go shopping we have food available you know this um um buy three for the price of two and (laughs) you know do you need that (laughs) sometimes you have a big quantity you know you end up wasting it yeah and i don't think it's it's a good strategy and it's not cost effective especially you know basically you need to plan yeah for what you need by when so that you don't end up with the food in the fridge that you, you end up throwing it away. Right. It's really thinking about not wasting, right? Yeah, it's That's common sense. Much. You know, I have to tell you a story. I went to, there's a, there used to be a place in Montreal. I lived there. I went to university there. Uh-huh. And um, they, they served one thing every night. Everyone got the same thing, but you got it in different sizes. So you ordered it in an mm. extra small, small, medium, large, or an extra large, right? Food was delicious. If you ordered the food and you didn't finish it, they would not allow you to order dessert. Oh. Mm. And if you ordered dessert and you didn't finish it, you weren't allowed back. Ah, interesting. Ever? Ever. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. So it was this idea that, you know, you really had to, and you could share. So, like, people could help you, and, like, it wasn't like it was just you. <laughs> it's like a reverse food challenge, like right? when people do the wings challenge. Yeah. Different way. Yeah. Different way. And it was like, I remember it so distinctly now, even so mm. many years later, because it was the first time as a large group ordering that we started to think, well, actually, how much do we want to eat? Mm. And like, are you going to help me with mine? And like, is that going to be? And there was no waste at the end of the meal. Mm. And it really made me think about how we just, we don't, that's, we, you know, we want to be abundant. We want to be generous. So we just order and it's like a, a cultural thing. But actually, you could, you know, this, this place really made you challenge it. And I just mm. remember it. And I think yeah. it's probably shut now, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. it was pretty awesome. Yeah. We were talking earlier about the change in business model. Yeah. And this is what we convey as key messages for, for FAO who to achieve this transformation. The second thing is the change in mindsets. Mm. That's exactly what we're talking yeah, about. I think yeah, our yeah. listeners need to, you know, just think about every action we do every day and what impact it has on the environment and on our health. That's why we were saying earlier, every action we take is important and our choices matter. And I think it's important because it's on different levels, right? And I think you speak a lot about the, the shift in mindset, which feels like really urgent. And I think that shift in mindset is really necessary on, on the individual level, but also on a systems level and, yes. and a corporate level. And in terms of like, ev- everybody's got to change that paradigm for it to work, which is, and it's nice to hear that it's happening, right? Yeah. Which is encouraging. Yeah. Well, the world has changed and it will continue to change. Right. So we have to adjust to the new reality. Mm. You know, we can't keep doing business as usual for everything. You can't. Mm. Yeah. So that's why we really, as individuals, we have to rethink our connection with food. We have to rethink how we use our natural resources. 
And as I said, the impacts our choices are making on the environment mm. because we cannot live our lives if we don't have the, the basis, which is a healthy environment that mm -hmm. enables us to produce food and live, enjoy that environment. So in FAO, we have four key principles for that. Mm -hmm. you know, if we want to improve people's lives to have a better life, then we need to have a better environment that mm -hmm. can allow us to have a better production mm -hmm. and better production for better nutrition. Mm -hmm. So better production, better nutrition, better environment and better life. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And this is critical. This is the basis. And I think we have to reconnect with the basics so that we understand that if we don't respect that and have the foundation solid, everything else will be affected. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Here's one confession. Okay, yeah, you're inspired. You're inspired. No, you remind me. Yeah, when I um, was planning my my travel to come here, <clears throat> so I went to Washington. Uh, and sounded I sounded a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I was planning to to come as I did <clears throat> last night to New York. And my plan was to come by train. Yes. Honestly. Yeah. I really <laughs> wanted to come. Was. It was. Gotcha. It was. <laughs> it was. That's right. To come by train. And then my calendar started to get busier and busier. Right. And I was nervous not to, to be on time for mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So I decided at the end, you know, I, I'm going to fly. Yeah. Yeah. But then... Yesterday, when I arrived to New York, before, I regretted it because my flight was delayed by two hours. Oh, and I was oh, stuck at the airport. It was anyway. horrible. I was thinking, you know, the train, you stretch your legs, you work, yeah, yeah, you yeah. look at the landscape, you don't have to be at the airport three hours before, etc. And it drops problem. you at the town center. Yeah. So that was a mistake. Mm. I regretted it so much. I and you know what? Yeah. In the US, there's really like the train infrastructure here is not great. So, mm. okay. you know, I think in Europe, or, you know, we're all... Right, we, we used to like... We used to be like, yeah, I was going to take the Euro train, it's going to be easy. But I also had to take the train mm. from DC to here. And I was like, I did it, but it was... You were just like, oh yeah, mm. they need to <clears> invest <throat> a lot in their train infrastructure mm, here. Yeah. Just to add something, in my house, I have 16 solar panels... I collect rainwater. <laughs> he's, like, like, he's like, I just want to... I'm, 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 I'm catching... It. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I collect rainwater and I have a hybrid car, so you are, which I right. only use like once every six okay, months or something. Right. So you're this is in the UK. You're accumulating your carbon credits. It's yes. offset, use, offset. And, offset. and I always walk to work. <laughs> okay. No, honestly, when I was in Paris... I walked to the office for one hour and 10 minutes oh, wow. each way. That's extensive. It was That's enjoyable. Extensive. extensive. That's a I lot. don't know which e word it is, but it's one of them. To be honest, enjoyable. At, at the beginning, when I was looking at the maps, in an hour, 10 minutes, yeah, that's very challenging. I'm going to give it a go and see how it goes. Yeah. To be honest, there were day, days where it was a torrential rain. I took the metro. Okay, but then every day I was, you know, walking, listening to the music, and then mm -hmm. that's how I get my ideas as well. Right. When I'm walking, so it yeah. works for me. And yeah. now I actually could go I like that. I love the Shift I love mindset. the anti climate. Says so this yeah. in a balance. Thank you so much for taking Thanks the time. Thanks very much to chat Thank with you. us about this, and we've learned so much about the food systems yeah. and a um, bit of mindfulness in there as well. So mm. we really appreciate it, and uh, yeah, thanks so much. And remember. Stay curious. Thank you for joining us this week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please hit the follow button to make sure you get next week's release. We are now officially crowdsourcing Climate Confession, so please leave yours in the ratings and the review section, and we'll shout out for you next time. And shout out to our fabulous team behind the pod. This episode was produced by Josie Coulter. Comms written by Tess Lowry. Artwork designed by Rebecca Mingus. Curation by Marion Pasha. Mix and engineered by Ben Beheshti. Music also by Ben Beheshti. Presented by Ben Hurst. And Marion Pasha. Remember, stay curious.